So, let us again summarize our progress from last episode. Following the successful crewed flight to gather biome data down in Texas, we built and launched our two final sounding rockets. The first to finish our Kármán line recovery contract, and the second one to complete the 3000 km downrange milestone contract. We closed the episode on that final rocket finishing up its burn over the west coast of Florida. But before we get back to the action, let us quickly address where we are in the series. Or, another way to frame it is, where have I been for the past few weeks? Well, there are a hundred excuses I could pull, but the important bit is that you should not worry, I still intend to finish this series. In this episode, we're going to follow the ongoing launch to its conclusion, and all that remains after that, until we get to orbit, is to launch a couple of crewed suborbital flights. In other words, of the main series, there are only another two or so episodes to go before I've covered the main points. Following that, I may release some shorter tips and tricks videos covering specific topics that I find useful to know in the early to mid RP1 game, but that is all pending further real world developments allowing me the time to do so. But that is all in the future, for now we should get back to where we left things off and see if we are about to complete or fail that downrange milestone contract. Now, uh, how do you know with these downrange distances, let's just bring up the contract, how do you know for sure that you're going to hit them. Well, that's uh, that's an academical question in and of itself. Um, well, uh, what the way you can watch this is uh, I should mention that you have your F3 me menu where you have your total distance covered or ground distance covered. These are not accurate by any means for uh, referencing to the contract. I, this is uh, ground distance of. 574 kilometers. However, the contract says 314. Uh, this doesn't update as often though as the also correct MechJeb version down here, which says our downrange distance is currently 350. And you will see that this soon after updates to a value very close to that. So this updates only about like every five seconds. This keeps you, this has your live coverage. And because of the symmetry of all things, you can pretty much say that when you reach your app lapse, uh, you have traveled half your downrange distance. Uh, you have to be suborbital for the downrange distance to count here, uh, I think. As in, you need to reach this downrange distance before you go below 140 kilometers at the end of your trajectory. Uh, but I may be wrong in that because it's crossed out. So just as long as you get to 3000 before burning out uh, or burning up, I should say, you should be fine. Anyways, uh, yes, uh, you've seen this launch before, haven't you? Uh, in low resolution and slightly blurry in the background of the beginnings of every video, we've been discussing things. So uh, it's going to go up, it's going to traverse a large part of the US, in fact all of the US, uh, well in a straight line, so we we miss uh, we miss Minnesota or whatever is over there, right? Uh, but uh, on our way we're going to hit uh, a lot of biomes, uh, forests first, then shores and water, again shores, now we're over the grasslands, and uh, all of this is going to add to our science pool in a way that launching out over the water wouldn't. Uh, before this is through, I believe we're also going to hit the deserts and the mountains. And if our flight path was slightly different, there would be a chance that we could hit tundra over here as well. So depending on how you tweak this launch, there is still a lot of science to be gained, even though we're not actually bringing along any fancy science experiments other than the telemetry unit, well, which we already needed to begin with, so... But yes, you can see we have just passed our app labs and our current downrange distance is 2.4 million meters or 2,400 kilometers to put it in the context of the contract itself and in values that we actually understand or can, uh, well, relate to. Uh, but um, but beyond that, uh, I was hoping we would get some mountains. Let's see. So we got the Rockies, they go down like that, right? I mean, all of this is the Rocky Mountains, I believe. Rockies are a wide thing. But apparently we're, and there's a gap in the mountains 
between the mountains down in Mexico and this because we haven't hit any mountains. So uh, I, I was I was wrong about that, which you are allowed to be, I believe. Uh, anyways, we're coming down here over um, well the Californian Peninsula. So we have the um, state of California here. I believe the border to Mexico is over there. So sorry, Mexico. No, we're just throwing a, a lot of stuff all, all, all over you. But as you can see, uh, we're currently at the downrange distance of uh, 4 million meters, more or less. And we still have a few kilometers to go before we hit the atmosphere. So all in all, we have margins on this launcher. And if you want to steer it manually uh, or with some script, uh, well, feel free. Uh, do feel absolutely free to add a avionics unit to to the first stage uh, because uh, with the current design uh, this wasn't really the optimal flight path it was the best I could do in like 10 tries uh, it's going to get us get you as far as you need to go if you aim it correctly that means you can uh, properly min-max the amount of biomes that you're going to hit along your trajectory. However, out of um, out of Vandenberg here, we're going to be sending the signal to uh, uh, destroy this because, uh, well, if we don't, the atmosphere will. Uh, we have completed another bunch of contracts and made big bank. It's time we spend this money. And we'll see exactly how I stitch this episode together because I started talking about this rocket earlier. No, not this rocket. What's that rocket? It's ugly. Doesn't carry any crew. This, this rocket is what we're going to be launching next. And I have talked about it at some length and I'm going to have to stitch together the parts. Okay, and then we have the uh, suborbital launcher that we will be using to breach the uh, Carmen contract line thing for manned launches. Fantastic. Uh, yes, uh, this is uh, a design that works. It is a simple design. It's easy to fly. Uh, and it has some differences to uh, the design that Neff suggests, which is basically the same design uh, with the big exception being this avionics that I have added to it. Uh, so uh, as we launch these uh, suborbital uh, manned flights, uh, we're also going to bring along a film camera under here. And the idea is that we want to be able to hit as many biomes as possible uh, with these launches, which means that we want to steer them in different directions going out from the Space Center. Uh, the hard way to do that is to angle the rocket on the pad and do a passive steered launch the way we're going to be performing our downrange contract. The easier way and the way we're, uh, I'm going with here is to have an avionics unit on the rocket so that we can steer it once we're in the air. Uh, this will mean, well, this coupled with the design and the flight path that we're going to follow with this uh, uh, suborbital uh, X-plane thing. I don't know, should you even call it a plane? Uh, X uh, thing with flaps on it, I should say. <laughs> uh, it's going to, well, we're going to want to be hit hitting altitudes that are not too high and we want to have enough downrange speed so that we can translate our our lift into slowing down and not crushing our pilots and making them black out and all of that uh, it's going to be way easier to hit those downrange speeds and the exact flight paths using an using avionics uh, carrying this with us uh, rather than uh, trying to eyeball it now the rocket would be building a lot faster were it not for this avionics because you can see that the cost of this avionics unit is 500 funds which is a sizable part of the rocket itself uh, so if you really want to min max this uh, felt that you were up to up to par with your science you can you could uh, do the same angling trick on this rocket as we're going to do with our downrange rocket launch 
but I, I, I just want to make it a bit simpler for ourselves. So this is the design where I'm going with. Anyways, following this last launch that we conducted, we now have enough funds to properly unlock everything that we need for this rocket. We already have the engines and the tooling and all of that from our last rocket. Those are all going to be the same. Uh, we don't have to unlock anything for the avionics. Those are not part of the tooling. Uh, maybe at some point, but not right now. Uh, what we need is the wings, which are these wings, the supersonic wings. Now these are the static version, which this does not use. So these are all, all moving wings. However, unlocking one uh, is the same as unlocking all of them. Uh, you uh, would be right to be scared seeing that the unlock cost of each category of procedure wing is 10,000 funds and be thinking, oh no, do I have to save up 30,000? And it's not clearly explained, but if you unlock one type of procedural wing uh, at a certain class, in this case, supersonic, well, the other two uh, are unlocked at no additional cost. So uh, we have made sure to tool everything on this rocket, except for this one. We're going to add that to our tooling as well, because we're going to be launching this rocket a lot. And as I said, the tooling cost is not only going to reduce the cost to build the rocket initially, but also the rush building cost of the rocket, which will tally up to, uh, well, in total, we're going to be spending six times this amount to build one of these. So that's uh, uh, 2,400 funds for each rocket that we're saving. Uh, so at two rockets, we have already saved in pretty much all the cash of the tooling on top of building these faster. If we compare here, uh, 311 days without this tank tooled with tooling 283 days. So, uh, not only are we saving money, we're saving that time as well. Uh, add to that. <laughs> That we're not going, going to be building this only once or twice. We're going to be launching this exact this design at least four times, perhaps five. Uh, but we shall initially build two of them. So that we have one building and then once we get to the part where we have to roll this first one out, the second one will already be in the queue. First one is the one we rush build initially and following that rush building process uh, we're sitting at about 167 days to finish building one of those with one additional uh, point here available to spend. So we could either spend it in the VAB, this is also a, a matter of taste, but uh, Really, we're not interested in launching these as much as we are in interested in getting to orbit. And the thing that's gatekeeping us right now is not it's not our build rate. We don't need to build a, a lot of these. Uh, these are to pass the time until we have the science needed to get to orbit, which either is going to be right here with avionics prototypes if we build a very primitive rocket or it's going to be um, here after we unlock orbital rocketry. So as you can see in either case, well, we want to increase our, uh, our science speed a lot. So the free point, we we'll put that in there uh, and beyond that, we're going to spend I think I overspent, didn't I? <laughs> I should be careful when I click stuff because we need to afford rolling this out as well, don't we? Right. Uh, currently our uh, costs are low. I think we can actually afford to do that. So this is going for the extreme. <laughs> this is getting exciting. Uh, if you ever run out of funds completely, that's not the end of the world. You can always just throw up another sounding rocket for, for cash. Uh, but if we're min-maxing, we don't 
ever want to end up in that situation. Anyways, in 167 days, let's hope we have some cash left in the bank by then. Uh, as you can see, we're constantly bleeding out money here at a rate of 2,600 per year. Well, that's after half a year, more or less. A, li a little less. A little less. Uh, so, so, yeah. <laughs> This is going to be interesting. Let's see. So now in 53 days, our first suborbiter will be ready. Uh, let's review. Do we get uh, any repeatable? Uh, we get the break the sound barrier as well. I knew we had some uh, something up our sleeves. Uh, yeah, but uh, we're going to need to complete this before we get the repeatable suborbital. Uh, contracts. Uh, with that we're also going to obviously break the sound barrier. So we have that uh, cash in our bank as well. And um, this has a duration of two years and we're not going to be necessarily ready. Well we are going to be ready to do it in two years but let's save accepting that for after we f finish this contract, just to be playing it a bit safe. So you can see the rollout time for this is 20 days. And uh, our uh, mission training here is less than 20 days. So in this case, we don't actually have to do this beforehand, before the vessel is finished. Later on, uh, we uh, will want to perform this before before our, we start our rollout. So that's just something to keep in mind because later capsules have longer rollout times or rather later craft have long, longer training times compared to the effective rollout times of those vessels. Right. Yeah, it's okay. So we're finally ready to put someone in space. I love space. That's where we wanna go. That's where we wanna stay. Uh, however, Mr. Bobby Crash here, Mr. Bobby Crash our tables, uh, is, um, well, he's not going there to stay, he's just going there to visit. Okay, so we're out here on the pad with Bobby, who's green for some reason. Yeah, uh, I have issues with this install, as I mentioned. What do we need to do, Bobby, to do here? Well, he's going to have to break the sound barrier. Well, that's going to be easy. Uh, he's also going to have to pass the Carmen line, and again, that's... That's not very hard, is it? I don't know. I've never been. Uh, Bob is going there though. So um, it's finally time to bring up some new windows here. I'm going to want to manually apply this. As I mentioned, we have avionics on this for the first time in this playthrough. Uh, so we can actually control it. And uh, rather than trying to uh, use the launch guidance for whatever the peg, because which is useful for getting into orbit. Uh, I don't see how that's going to help us uh, properly steer our way around here. Now, which way are we going? Oh no, this is a disaster. Uh, this is a plane. Okay, so which way are we going? Uh, we want to hit as many biomes as possible uh, using these suborbital flights because each biome that we hit, well, we're going to get a lot more science. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to start launching from the shores biome, right? And uh, each flight here, we're going to be steering it in a different direction. And as I've said, there are three biomes that we can possibly hit uh, in, uh, in our vicinity. Uh, we can hit the water, we can hit the shores, and we can hit the forest. And we want to make sure that we hit flying high and space low uh, for each of these biomes, ideally. That way we get the full science payout of our crew reports and our cameras. So, uh, how do we do that? Well, I would say we start simple and work our way up. And the simple way is of course to get the water. Because it's all the way over here and it's hard to miss and all of that. So no, no real staring needed. Uh, to be nice to, to Bobby here, 
named after Cosmonaut Crash, obviously. Uh, we are going to uh, be flying this uh, shuttle style upside down uh, to push him into his seat rather than out of it. And uh, to prepare for that, we're going to go into our s -well Plus, which we'll be following for most of the time, and make sure we set our roll to 180 there as well. So now we have our correct heading pitch and rolls settings. Uh, we have we have smart ASS trying to steer while we're here to make sure that we don't shake off in some weird direction. We're going to turn it off initially, turn it on when we release the clamps, and then we're going to launch the rocket. Yes, that's why we brought it out here. So ignite the rocket and ride up on that flame and activate our stability. Great. Okay. So. Uh, this is going to be a short and quick and eventful flight, so let's try to keep it condensed as much as possible. Initially, we want to wait until about 120 meters per second vertical speed. And uh, as you can see, as long as you give the heading here, it's going to oscillate a bit. So as soon as we feel that we're actually on a good la launch azimuth, uh, we want to get a bit surface velocity plus because it has an easier way to control that way. Uh, then we want to pitch down even more than we are now. But since we're turned upside down, we need to increase our relative pitch here. And uh, right now, well, I have this dynamic pressure readout, which tells us we are past max Q. We haven't flipped out yet, so I'm going to tentatively try to steer over as much as possible because we want sideways velocity. Uh, apart from getting up to 140 kilometers, there's really not, not much more uh, for us to gain in gaining altitude. Instead, we want to be heading sideways as quickly as we can, which means that since our apps is high enough right now, we're going to be extremely pitched over here to get as far sideways as possible uh, so that we can utilize, u u utilize the lift of this vehicle. Now we're flying high over Earth's shores and it gives us the crew report, which we can transmit right away. But also important note here is that we brought the film camera. So yes, uh, and it's giving us the telemetry al analysis as well once we transmitted I don't know what it's doing. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, we're going to ditch this, this film camera as I uh, alluded to in earlier footage. Uh, I think it was last episode or no, probably the episode. Ah, I don't know. I'm just recording all of this and then I'm stitching it together. Yeah, magic is gone. Uh, we, we have that, right? Didn't it? No, what's that? I don't know. Didn't we get a crew board flying low over water earlier? I don't know what's going on. But we're going to hold on to this rocket until we get up into space proper. Because once there, we're going to run this, uh, this uh, photography again. That's now. Okay, can you please let me click it? Planetary photography, another 3.8 science, which is massive. Uh, we drop that into there. Uh, we get that. And of course, we already have the telemetry analysis from our previous sounding rocket. So it's time we ditch that and uh, arm our RCS ports. Now, how do you fly this? Well, you set it to horizontal velocity plus, and then you let it angle itself in like so. It's going to flip around. It's going to keep its steady heading along your prograde vector with respect to the ground. And as we come down, well, we're going to come down rather hard. This was a much steeper ascent than I would be hoping for but I think we will be fine utilizing the lift of this vehicle nonetheless. So, um, did we get the contract?
things checked out? Well, <laughs> we got milestones. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, yes. We can remove those from the view. I don't think that removes the payout from from them. So we got the altitude records, speed records, all of that. Speed records, speed records. A few more to go there. We only had to return safely to get this checked off. And we only have to return safely to get that done as well. So that's fantastic. Bobby is now reaching his app apps, so we're halfway through the flight and uh, we're st going to start falling down towards the surface again. How is that going to look? Well, it's going to look a lot more uh, exhilarating if we time warp. And as you can see, our prograde vector here is deviating downwards, um, but it's not going to deviate much past 45 degrees which is about deflection we can manage to keep with this craft because both these fins and these fins are all moving control fins. They are not static wings, which means that we can maintain a very high level of... Uh, a, a very high degree of control uh, in this flight. So as we come down here, we're going to pass through the Karman line again at 100 kilometers. And uh, way past that, we are going to start seeing some serious deceleration by keeping this deflection going. So you can see now that our um, vertical speed is now exceeding our horizontal speed. So we are now deflected more than 45 degrees off. You can see that our, uh, our reaction control thrusters have started firing, begun firing. But right now, uh, most of our control is exerted by these fins. So if we were to say, turn that off, we would only deflect a little. See how we manage, because, because our center mass is not much further ahead of uh, our uh, center of drag, we are able to deflect this much uh, with uh, rather minor control inputs. And you can see that on deceleration, well, we're hitting high g-forces here, but it's absolutely in, in, in the realm of uh, survivability for our pilot. And in fact, if you, if you manually adjusted this uh, further and made sure that you had a even higher uh, transversal velocity, I guess you would say, uh, horizontal velocity is what we usually call it, so I should call it that, uh, you would be able to uh, get this descent even gentler, probably down to like seven Gs or something. It's not, it's not, it's not gentle compared to an orbital return, but, uh, but this is a very capable uh, suborbital gl glider. So the only thing remaining in this flight is to land Bobby in one piece. Can we do that? Well, that remains to be seen in the penultimate episode of this RP-1 series. We shall also have to see if I leave you on a cliffhanger for as long as I did leading up to this episode. If you have any questions about the contents in this episode, or any suggestions on how to improve the series, please leave them in the comments section below. I'm Gaspachian, and I hope to see you in the next episode.